Hello, my name is Martin Hash, author of Animation Apprentice. The purpose of this video is to introduce you to this unique and time-efficient method of computer animation. Our purpose is to help you tell your story, and all of our products have that as their aim. I hope you find this video entertaining and helpful. It is full of animations created by Apprentice, exposition, and demonstrations. It's obvious that the biggest advantage of computer animation is the speed at which the animation is created. A more subtle but equally important advantage of computer animation over traditional animation is that the computer performs most of the artistic requirements in terms of drawing, shading, perspective, and all of the other incredibly difficult things that it takes a talented artist to do. This means that people like me, who are meager artists at best but with little talent and great ambition, can tell the computer to be the artist and we can be the director. All characters start as two-dimensional paintings, which are converted into three dimensions by the computer. Essentially, you provide the front and side silhouettes, which are usually easy to make, and the computer helps you turn these into fully shaded, colored, articulated characters that have personality and empathy. Our special technique uses a major innovation called surface detail mapping. This means that you can take any ordinary picture and put it onto the objects that you make. It adds incredible realism to the scene with little construction cost to you. You could take a picture of someone you know, put it onto a head object, and your friends would recognize it. You could even have the head talk. Mechanical objects and geometric primitives are just as simply made. The characters that you create with Apprentice are similar to this marionette. Each segment is one of the movable pieces, such as the calf, thigh, arms, hips, head, etc. Of course, an Apprentice character can be much more articulated and complicated than this. You must create a front and side view of each of the segments, such as a front and side view of the torso. This is the character that we're going to model after our marionette. Each movable segment is created separately. Each movable segment is actually created of slices. Here we show the same character, but with only every tenth slice shown. The different colors represent the different movable pieces. Let's go ahead and create one of those segments, this torso. Segments start out as silhouettes of the front and side views. These are called the visage and profile. The visage is the front view. The profile is the right view. The way Sculpt operates is it takes the visage and front view, puts them together. The sculpt module then creates slices that fit around this cross-sectional representation of the segment. The slices stack on top of each other. Create each segment by first painting a full color view of the front mat. A very important point here is that this background white color is actually the second color down in the deep paint palette, not the first as you would expect. It's the second color, the white color picture near the center of the screen just for consistency. If you've painted the mat, you must make the silhouette of the front. The easiest way to do that is to simply grab the mat as a brush, select stencil, make, select that white background color, make. Now select black as the background color, which is the top, and you now have your silhouette of the visage, this is called the visage silhouette, perfectly placed on the screen to align with the front view. Now let's draw a silhouette of seeing this torso from the right side. Now that you've created your silhouette, it's time to put in the auto shaping line. Select the line gadget, and very importantly, select a fourth color down in the palette. Carefully bisect your segment stretch the line all the way to the top. The auto shaping line must extend the entire length of the mat. Let's look at the profile silhouette. Notice how the auto shaping line is curved. That means that the front will be rounder than the back. The roundness goes opposite the direction of the auto shaping line. Now finish with your two silhouettes and your front mat quit D-Paint and enter the Sculpt module. Let's enter the Sculpt module. 
you will spend a lot of time in Sculpt because that's where you create your segments and apply your texture mapping. There are two basic concepts in Sculpt. One is of the blank segment and how you create the contours of that segment. And one is of how the texture map goes on to the contours. These are two completely separate entities. Let's create the torso that we have been looking at. Select Matte Front from the menu item. Find the torso listing. Select torso visage, that's the front silhouette. Now select mat left right from the storage menu. Select torso pro P for profile, which is the side silhouette have to change the color of the lines due to the color map. So the lines are always the second color from the end. Let's take change it to something more visible. Bright green, for example. Now, ensuring that these vertical lines are always to the far left, and you can do that because the coordinate should read 255, and over here this should be f 0, not 4. The 4 to a 0, simply Put your pointer in the profile area and hit the left arrow key until it goes to zero. Now we're going to auto sculpt this segment using these two silhouettes, the visage and the profile, by selecting from the shape menu the auto sculpt circular menu item. Then grab this horizontal line and move it to the top of the segment. You can sculpt any or part of this segment just by how far you move the horizontal line. If you move it up this far, then this, the sculpting will only go from the bottom of the segment to this point, but we want to sculpt the whole thing. Then click the Do It gadget. The snooze pointer will appear. Wait a few moments for the segment to be auto-sculpted and the pointer to change back. Now we have to fill the gaps. Let me show you why. If we say Touch Up Top, we can see this segment. However, there are white holes as the segment slices come up, especially around the shoulders. These in so the shell will be solid and that we don't see into the segment from the outside. Select Fill Gaps from the Shape menu. Again, grab the horizontal line and move it to the bottom. Click the Do It gadget and wait again for the snooze icon to disappear. Filling gaps may take significantly more time than auto-sculpting. Don't be surprised if it takes several minutes or more. We have now completed the shell of the segment. Let's look at the segment after gaps were filled. Again, we touch up top. And you'll notice that there are no more spaces between the slices, even up at the shoulders. After you have auto-sculpted and filled gaps, it is time to stamp out the back silhouette of this segment. Select Touch Up Back, and the back will be drawn. This will be perfectly placed if you needed to texture it on. Now click the Stamp Gadget. You will be asked to save the mat. Select Torso B for Back, and Save. Go back to D-Paint and paint this back silhouette as it truly should be with all of its colors. Then come back to Sculpt, and we will texture on the front and the back and finish our segment. Texture map on our front and back views of the segment, not the silhouettes. Torso front. and then back bottom, torso B for back. There are actually two buffers for these two images, so the front view is still in the computer's memory. Now say texture front. Let's take a look at this. Touch up right, 
and we can see the, t the front map was put on our black segment. Now, texture back. Let's take a look at the right-hand side again. Now our back mat is put on. All of this black area could be filled with a right or left-hand mat if you have one drawn, or you can use the finish command. Let's go ahead and finish. To finish, select the finish front to back item. Let's look at the right mat. We can see that all of the spaces in between have been filled. Finish is a useful tool, but can be fooled easily. Let's paint onto our segment. First, use touch up for the view that you want, in this case, the front view. Position the zoom box in the area that you want to paint on and click the zoom gadget. Select a color out of the palette, in this case, turquoise, that you want to paint with. And then simply depress the left mouse button to put that color onto the segment. If you wanted to pick a color that was already on the segment, you simply point at it and click the right mouse button. That new color now becomes your paint color. As you can see, we have put the new color on the segment. The new color does not appear on these views because these views are not actually the segment. The views in the visage and profile area are the mats that were loaded off the disk. They will not reflect any of the changes that you do. Let's assume that you want to change the contours of one of the slices. Move the slice bar until you find the appropriate slice or press the up and down arrow keys. As you can see, I can select any slice that I want in this manner. Now move the zoom box over to the slice and click the zoom gadget. You'll see the slice drawn in a zoom fashion. By simply depressing the left mouse button, I can draw a little contour onto my slice. By depressing the right mouse button, I can erase part of a contour. I can also use these gadgets over here to draw, for example, a straight line from that point to that point. Click return to get back to the main screen, and after you are satisfied with your changes, always select the save slice command. Now, I'll go up to the slice above this one, and then back down to this slice, and I'll see that my changes have been saved. If I hadn't have selected the Save Slice command, those changes would not have occurred. I can strike this slice by selecting the Strike menu item in the Shape menu and click the Do It gadget. That slice is now gone and cannot be recovered. I now need to copy a slice into that area that I have just deleted. I select the Copy Permanent menu item in the Shape menu and I will be asked to select a slice. I can come down to this area in coordinate and see that my current slice is 98. That's the blank one. The slice right above it will have something in it. So that will be 99. I type 99 and hit the return key. That slice will be copied into the area. I must again select Save Slice. Now I have recovered at least a semblance of the slice that I deleted. And my torso will probably be fine. There are many other features in the Sculpt module. Refer to your manual for specific applications. The last thing we do is to move the X coordinate bar and the Z coordinate bar and the slice bar down to where the pivot of this character segment will be. In this case, it's at 121, 60, 94. Once you have selected the pivot, you can see on the slice and where in the slice the pivot will be down in this area, the slice area. Select the pivot command in the operators menu to set the pivot. You will see that these coordinates are translated up to the pivot area. Select save to save your torso. Select quit to exit the sculpt module. To define the relationship among the segments. When I move my arm, my hand moves. When I move my hand, my finger moves. But when I move my finger, my arm doesn't move. This is called hierarchy of motion. 
my finger is a progeny of my hand, and my hand is a progeny of my arm. When I move my torso, both my left and right arms move. However, when I move my left arm, my right arm doesn't move. My left and right arms are siblings to each other. Let's talk about the character module. Normally, you use the character to module to modify an already predefined character that you have in your library. However, you can also use it to load, to make your own character from scratch. Let's load the biped from our library disk. This rather intimidating screen is actually quite easy and simple to understand. What we have here is a hierarchical representation of our human figure. All of these boxes connected together on a horizontal line are called siblings. All of the boxes connected together vertically are called progeny. The difference between the two is progeny move when their parent moves. Siblings are all related to each other, but they don't move when one of the ones in the front of the list moves. Let's just look at the layout of our biped. This bone is the pelvis. It has the, the ultimate bone, the patriarch bone, called a handle, which is a special case and used to move this character around in the director module. Let's go back to the pelvis. Connected to your pelvis is the thigh and the other thigh. And connected to the progeny is the torso. Connected to our torso is left shoulder, right shoulder, head. Those are all siblings to each other. Connected to the shoulder is the forearm. Connected to the forearm is the hand. If we go on over here to the thigh, connected to it is the calf. Connected to the calf is the foot. Connected to the foot is the toes. Foot is placed in a character. You can look at the placement by using the place menu item, representation of our character called the biped, looking from the back. This highlighted bone down here was the one that we just clicked on back when we were looking at the bone boxes, and it is the foot. If I depress the left mouse button, I can move the foot all around with respect to its parent. In this case, its parent is the calf. I want the foot right underneath here. However, I could move the foot over and leave it there. Let's move the foot back on over. We hit the space bar to get back to the bone boxes. Now I have selected the thigh back at the bone box screen. Notice how the thigh and all of its progeny connected together and they highlight. This is an example of the difference between progeny and siblings. The progeny, once I select the ultimate parent, will move all together. Yet the siblings, and the two thighs here are siblings, only one will move as I position it with the play screen. The F1 and F2 arrow keys toggle between the top view and the back view. The reason we have selected the back view to look at is because the right arm on this character will be in the same position as your right arm as you view it from the screen. It's not reversed as it would be if we were looking at a front view. Again, remember to hit the space bar to get back to the bone screen. Let's look at the relationship of position bone length and extents. We asked you to take to build mats in the sculpt module and put them all together on the same screen. I have done that here. I have the torso, the pelvis, one each of the thigh and calf and shoulder and forearm. The numbers that are written on these each of these mats represent either position or extent, which we'll now explain. Let's look at the thigh. The pivot of the thigh is right where I have my crosshair, and it's shown by a black spot on this mat. The length of the thigh, or the bone length, the number you put in extent 2, will be 63, and it is from the pivot down to the connection point of the knee where the calf will connect. So this has a length, a bone length of 63 with the pivot here and the connection length at the knee here. This is not the length from 
the top of the sphere to the bottom of the sphere, but from the pivot to the connection point. The connection point passes through the pivot of the calf. Let's go to the connected drawing. Here's our thigh. Here's our calf. Here's the pivot of the thigh up at the connection point on the pelvis and the pivot of the calf up at the connection point at the knee on the thigh. The length of the calf is 66, and that is from its pivot down to the connection point of where the foot will be. These extents are w in the y direction, which is vertically, and they are negative because the bone goes down to the connection point from the pivot. Let's look at the torso. The pivot at the torso is at the very bottom. The extent 2 is, goes up in the vertical direction, direction so that it's positive up to where the head will connect. So this is a length of 75. So the extent on the torso is from the pivot to where the neck connects and that's where the head connects, and that's positive, and that's 75. Now let's talk about position. The position of the calf to, with relationship to the thigh is 63, which is the same as the length of the bone. Almost always, the position of a progeny will be equal to the length of the bone of its parent. The position of the thighs into the pelvis are x, this is in the horizontal direction, x19. Let's go to the connecting diagram. Here's the thigh, there's the pelvis. The thigh goes over 19 in the x direction positive, and the other thigh would go over 19 in the negative direction on the pelvis. Let's look at how the upper arm connects to the shoulder right here. From the pivot of the torso over to where the shoulder connects and the x direction is 33 and minus 33. So the upper arm will connect at position 33 and minus 33 into the torso and up of 75. Look on how to define a bone length in the module. We can do it in one of two ways, one of which is graphic. Select the bone box that you want to define the length on. Select the, the back of the bone. Place the cursor so that it's at the pivot, which is always zero, zero, zero. And drag the bone with the left mouse button depressed down to minus 64. Release the left button and hit the space bar. And bone length is with the info. Extent one is at zero x, zero y, 0z. That's at the pivot. Remember, 0, 0, 0 is always the pivot. Extent 2 is at y of minus 63 because the bone goes down and its length from the pivot down to the connection point of the calf is 63. We can also set the specular and diffuse values with this requester and name the bone. This bone is named phi. That must correspond with the name of the segment that we built called phi. This is where the, the program can decide on what segment to put onto the screen. This name and the name of the segment must be the same. Hit the return key to re remove that requester. To save your work before quitting the program. In fact, all figures with the same layout are grouped together and defined as a class. A class is a very important concept because of the next module, the action module. In the action module, we will show our character how to walk, run, sit, and anything else that you can imagine. When working with the action module, you must start somewhere. Here is a typical animator sketch pad showing a character walking, strutting, shuffling, sneaking, etc. Each image represents a frame number. The first image would be frame 1, the second one might be frame 5, the third one might be frame 11. Notice how an arm would start in the upright position and then in frame 9 be in a lower position. 
the movement from the upright position to the lower position is called a subaction. Let's go ahead and start the action module. The action module is where we define the relative actions of all of our characters. All these actions can be saved away in libraries. The first thing we have to do is load the character that we're going to define an action for. In this case, we're going to load the biped. The stick figure representation that you see is the same as the one that you created in the character module. Point the target at the thigh and click the left mouse button. The thigh and all of its progeny, including the calf and the foot, will highlight. Now let's go up to the Observe menu and select the right menu item. I now go to the Modify menu and select the Tweak menu item. Now, as I depress the right mouse button and move the mouse, the thigh will move. I move it up to a position where I think the initial thigh should be. Then I press the space bar. I now point at and select the other thigh. Again, I select the tweak menu item from the modify menu, depress the right mouse button, and move the thigh. Notice how the calf and foot move with it. I set the initial position on all the bones in the first frame. We can tell this is the first frame by looking at the frame number in the upper right hand corner of the screen. We've already defined the initial starting position of this walk action for the biped character. Now let's go in and put in some sub-actions. I select the thigh, and I select Add from the Modify menu. It now asks me to enter frames. I know from looking at my keyframe drawings that I want to have four frames till the next key of this thigh. I press the return key. Now I s depress the right mouse button and move the thigh back. Press the space bar. The frame number, number five, is in the upper right hand corner of the screen. I selected the action list menu item in the modify menu to see this page. In this page, I have all my sub actions broken out. As you can see, thigh is lifted in the upper left corner of the screen. And across the top, we have Translate, which is not used in this, these particular sub-actions. Scale, which is usually 100%, but can be used for stretch and squeeze. Rotate, which includes roll, tilt, and swivel, which is indeed what the bones are doing. And then ease frames and hold. On this particular page, we have three sub-actions. If we go over to the frames column, we can see the number 14. That means it takes 14 frames to get from the initial position to the first sub-action and then it takes 14 more frames to get from that subaction to the final subaction for a, for a total of 28 frames. So this sum up, this thigh bone will start at an initial position with a swivel of 21 degrees, take 14 frames to move to a swivel position of minus 18 degrees, and then 14 more frames to move back to its initial position. This is a cycle, 21 to minus 18 to 21 in a total of 28 frames. Select the return menu item in the edit menu to get back to the main screen. I want to audition my work after I've made all the sub actions. I simply select the return menu item in the modify menu, which takes me to the main screen. Then I select audition. The sleep pointer will appear while audition is calculated. Then the auditioning will begin. I can change the speed of the audition by hitting the function keys across the top of the screen. The F5 key is 12 frames per second, and that is the default. F4 is 10 frames per second. F3 is 8 frames per second. F2 is 20 frames per second. F10 is 4 frames per second. This walk looks quite natural. One slide, I hit the escape key so that then I may again pick a bone if one needs to be changed. In this particular keyframe, I select the forward menu item in the modify menu. So at frame 8, the character would look like this. I select forward again, and we go to frame 15. Now these are the keyframes in relationship to the torso. Each of the bones will have their own keyframe list. Right under the character, we see the heading roll, tilt, and swivel. That tells us what the angles are at that particular keyframe. So keyframe 15, roll is 0, tilt is 3, 
and swivel is minus 7 for the torso. Select return again to return to the main menu. To save our action, select the save action menu item, the action menu. You can also load a previously defined action to modify. Quit to exit. Now that we've got our library of characters and actions, it's time to put it all together. It's time for you to be the director of your own play. I find this the most stimulating part of computer animation. Let's start the director module. The director module is used to position characters on the stage. You're a director, and you're going to select your cast and the skit that each cast member will do. When the screen first appears, there will be two white diagonal lines. This is the viewing cone. We are looking at the stage from the top, and the viewers in the audience would be at the bottom. They are looking out onto the stage, and the viewing cone is what they'll see. As things get farther back in the stage, which is higher up to the top of the screen, they can see more of them. And as things get closer to the front of the stage, it clips sooner. Also, this viewing cone represents the perspective. All right. Let's add a cast member. Select Add from the Skit menu. A load figure requester will appear. We're going to add our biped character. The biped character is actually composed of several figures. The base figure, or the biped, first lists the actions that are available for it. In this case, we will select biped walk. Walk will now be assigned to the base biped. Then it will ask how many frames this walk should occur over. These are the relative number of frames. We will change it from 28 to 21. The next subfigure will then be selected by the computer, and a list of the actions available for it will be listed. You can see at the top of this requester, the next subfigure is the left hand. We will select no action. Dash NA usually means no action. Again, the number of frames, we will simply select the default. Now the right hand. Similarly, all the subfigures will have the actions available for them listed. And when the character is finally all loaded, a circular node will appear in the upper left of the screen. Simply move your pointer to position the node on the screen where you want it to be. As I move the node, the numbers in the upper right of the screen reflect its position. This is an absolute position name of the base character is listed just above the numbers. The arrow points to the top of the screen, which means away from the audience. We simply depress the left mouse button and move the pointer to turn the arrow so that this character points towards the audience. Let's add another node. Select the Add menu item from the Node menu. Enter the number of frames it should take to get to the next node. In this case, we'll put 12. The second note of this skit will then follow the pointer again as the first one did. Let's put it over here to the right and reposition the arrow by depressing the left mouse button again a little so that our character looks a little off to the left. The two notes connected together form a skit. The character will move from the first node to the second node in 12 frames. We can look at this graphically by selecting the node list menu item and see our two nodes listed. You can also add, modify, and delete nodes in this node list. Let's return back to our main menu. Let's look at the list of relative actions that will happen for this character during that 12 frames. I select the action list menu item. List the action list names the subfigure that was selected, in this case biped, and the list of actions that are relative to that figure. We have biped walk as the first action but we can always add another so that this character can take step after step, bend over and pick something off the floor. When I select Add, a list of all the eligible actions for this particular subfigure will be listed.
Let's select jump. The default frame numbers for the jump, which is 42, will appear. We don't want to have an animation that is 42 frames long, so we'll change that down to 10. Instead of the character jumping up and down in 42 frames, it'll now jump up and down in 10. Let's say I want to jump a second time. I can simply select copy, and another copy of this jump will occur. If I want to modify how many frames, I select the modify menu item and change the frame number to 12. Look over at the right of the screen and see the total number of frames for each of the relative actions and the number of hold frames. The total is 43. Select return to get back to the main screen. If I wanted to look at either the node list or action list for any of the subfigures of this character, I would simply select the next menu item. Up in the upper right, I can see which subfigure I will see the node list or action list for. Let's look at the action list for the left hand. There's the no action that we selected initially. If I select no other actions, and this animation is 20 frames long, then the last action, which in this case is hand no action, will happen for 20 frames. I go through all of the subfigures simply by selecting next. As you can see, it goes from head to mouth to biped again, all the way back to the beginning base figure. If I wanted to add a second cast member to this play, I would simply select Add Again from the Skip menu. Once again, all of the requesters would appear for the subfigures of that character. The second cast member of the skit will again appear in the upper left corner. Let's move him or her right to here, face the audience, add a second node that takes 23 frames to get to, and move the member over to here. To switch between the two cast members and subsequently get at their action list and their node list, press the F9 function key. The first node of each skit will highlight. Okay. To see a stick figure representation of the two cast members on the stage, select the perspective menu item. A frame number will request a world peer. Let's put a one so we can look at the first frame. Both of the characters will be drawn as they will appear in the first frame. As I click the right arrow key, I can see how they look in the second frame, the third frame, or I can press the return key and see how they look in the 14th frame. The black box represents what you will see on a low res picture. Everything outside of the black box will be what would be on a high res screen. Press the right mouse button to exit the perspective screen. To change the camera's position, select the camera menu item from the scene menu. This is the screen of viewing the camera down from the top. The box on the left side of the screen is the stage. This stage by depressing the left mouse button and moving the mouse. This little light source emblem here is the light source. I can move it simply by clicking the mouse button over the top of it and moving it. This is the camera. This is the first node of the camera list. I can move it by simply pointing at it, depressing the left mouse button, and moving. This white line is the view plane line. If I cross a view plane line with the camera, then my object will appear bigger than it was actually rendered. Let's add a second camera node. Similar to adding node members to skits, I select the add menu item from the truck menu. Enter the number of frames, let's say 12, and put a camera there. In 12 frames, the camera will start here and move to there. Similarly, by selecting the view menu item in the camera menu, I can see a f side view of the stage. The cameras look different. The stage and all of its activities are the same. The camera list controls its own stage position. With the side view, I tilt the stage so that I look down on top of characters or up from the bottom. I can even rotate the stage all the way around to the back. Modify many settings 
with the camera menu. I can return to the top view. I can change the stage settings, which includes the lights intensity, ambience, the view plane distance, which is the white vertical line that can get crossed, and the number of frames for the entire skit. I can also change the background color of this animation. The background color is the color that will be replaced when gen locking. I can change that color, however, to a light blue or a dark black. The IFF matte menu item will allow me to change the background picture that will be behind our animation in case we are not going to genlock. I simply type in the name of the matte that I want to be in the background. Let's say it is trees. Now I must make a trees matte and transfer it to the data disk. To return from the side camera view, we must select return. To return from the main screen, we must select return again. As you can see, because I have moved the camera, the viewing cone lines have changed. I can load a choreography or save the choreography I've just created. To exit the program, select quit. To see a real-time rehearsal of a choreography, select the rehearsal icon. A list of the possible choreographies appear. Let's look at the athletics choreography. You'll see a frame range of how long the choreography is. To make this one shorter, let's cut it down to only 45 preview frames. The word computing will be on the screen for as long as several minutes as the computer crunches away at creating the rehearsal choreography. The rehearsal begins immediately. You can see the frame numbers in the upper right hand corner and again the black outline box specifies the difference between high res and low res. I can stop and look at any individual frame by clicking the left mouse button. I can start again by clicking the right mouse button the frame speed of the rehearsal by pressing one of the function keys. Speed it up, our lower function keys. Slow it down, I higher function keys. Press the escape key to stop rehearsal once you are satisfied. Now let's render our work. Click on the record icon. The choreography control panel appears, and we are asked to insert our data disk. Let's pick the athletics choreography once again. It's loading up all of the choreography of athletics. Let's look at the panel. In the frame range, we can see the frame number 1 and 145. It's, this choreography starts at frame 1 and ends at 145. I can change that with these arrows. If I want to load a new choreography, I simply click this button. If I want to see low resolution, lace, or high, I simply click these buttons. Notice that when I select high, the colors go down to 16. I cannot select ham or 32 colors when we are in high res mode. But when I am in low res or lace, I can select those buttons. The mode that the animation is saved to the disk is selected by this requester. There's animop5, hash mode, and as a single IFF pictures so that we can go into a paint program and modify them. Preview is for looking at a particular frame without saving it to disk. This requester allows us to select shading, at which time smoothing comes on, but we can turn it off. Anti-aliasing if we're using a background mat. Locking the palette if that's important to prevent color blinking. Most of the time we will leave the palette unlocked. That's the default position. When we're ready to see a particular frame, we will simply click Go. The frame number, and if we are recording this to disk, the animation name, 
will appear in the upper left hand corner of the screen. When the cursor reappears, you can press the space bar to see the next frame in the preview or press the escape key to return to our control panel. Now that we've decided that we want to save this animation, let's select our mode, in this case Anim, take off Alias, and select Go. We now see a requester asking us where we want to save our animation to. We can click any disk, type in any path name, if we wanted to create our own path name, such as test slash test, and save this animation as test, then we click save. It will ask if we want to create these directories. The animation is done, and we've returned to the control panel, or we have pressed the escape key, and that prevents the animation from going any farther than the current frame it is working on. We can exit the program by hitting the stop button. However, we had a lot of fun making this video, and I know you're going to have even more fun turning your ideas into animations with Animation Apprentice. If you have any suggestions or recommendations, please feel free to contact us anytime. This is Martin Hash saying goodbye for now and thanking you for joining the animation experience. was the night before Christmas when in Santa's mailbox appeared a very nasty letter. It was from his superiors in the North Pole Toy Company and it read as follows. Dear Santa, we feel that you have too many workers to help you with toy delivery. We could put the help to better use in other divisions of the company. You may keep only one elf and one reindeer as help through the holiday season. Effective immediately. Well, poor old Santa was in quite a fix, and he was having a terrible time deciding who the elf was. But at last, he came to a decision. Rudolph, his truck clumsy old companion, would be the deer. But who for the elf? The answer was found in a small spastic character named Dizzy. He always had plenty of spunk, kind of like that. Well, there was no time to waste. The sleigh was packed and all were anxious to depart. But brewing to the west, tremendous storm, and it was headed for Santa's shop, as if he didn't have a problem. Rudolph, disoriented and confused, took care without Santa, and soon he was lost. He tried to rise a plastic to try a better view of things. Meanwhile, Santa's sleigh had been swept off the ground by the of wind. Ruth and ended up quite a bit with cloud. This is going all in the world, delivering presents as he went. Last, all of our friends returned home, and it was a very Merry Christmas after all. <laughs>